All right, <laughs> one more time. Welcome everyone. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. And um, we are so pleased to have you at our May webinar on open education, resilience in crisis and beyond. And we have some amazing uh, practitioners and experts um, in open education and also in uh, legal rights who are here to share with you today on uh, their strategies and the work they've been doing at their campuses. So this is our agenda for today. And before we jump in, I want to uh, introduce our speakers. Um, and so our first speaker up will be Tanja Connerly, who is Distinguished Sociology Faculty at San Jacinto Community College, and she's also the co-chair of the Houston Area OER Consortium. And uh, our next speaker will be uh, Suzanne Joaquin, um, who is um, biology faculty and also the coordinator of open educational resources, student learning outcomes, distance and distance learning at Butte Community College. She's also active at the statewide level in OER uh, in California. Um, and I think our next speaker is Michael Mills. Michael um, is the um, Vice President of E-Learning Innovation and Teaching Excellence at Montgomery College in Maryland. And I believe um, Mike will be taking um, the webinar from his car. <laughs> um, Mike's had a power outage at his home. Um, and I know many of us are having interesting um, situations working from home. Um, and our next two speakers are Quill West, who is the OER Project Manager at Pierce College in Washington State and also does instructional design work there. And Meredith Jacob, who is the Creative Commons Project Director at American University Washington School of Law. So um, a very uh, um, amazing panel today for you. And I wanna thank everyone who's been introducing themselves in the chat window. Uh, we have just, uh, from all over the country. Um, I think we even have some folks from Canada. So welcome uh, to Lee um, up in Canada from Rebus. Um, what I wanted to tell you about the format for today is um, each of our speakers has a topic that uh, they're focusing on um, around OER resilience. And that'll be the first half of our webinar. And then in the second half, we'll go into really panel mode um, where we will invite you um, to ask questions of our panelists. And you'll be doing that from the, the, um, the chat window. And we have a lot of attendees today. We've already hit 100. So um, we'll have to just use the chat window. And I thank you for that. All right, just a very brief overview before we um, get started about CCC OER. We've been working on OER at community colleges for over a decade now. Um, and um, our core work is helping faculty to find high quality um, OER and to select that for their classes um, in order to improve uh, student success. And um, our new effort in the last few years has been fostering regional OER leadership and collaboration. And I know a number of you are, are participating in that effort with us. Um, here is our current set of members, and we were very excited to introduce two new members in the last month or so. Um, we um, have Southeast Arkansas Community College that joined us, um, and that is our first college in Arkansas, and also um, Geneseo State College, I think, I'm sorry, State University of, as part of the State University of New York system also joined us as a member. So welcome to them. Um, I just wanted to mention our Extraordinary Stories site that we've been uh, running for about um, six weeks now. And um, we're welcoming any stories from your colleges and universities of extraordinary responses to the um, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Um, we have many here from um, 
faculty, instructional designers who are doing really amazing work with their students. We also have some students who are um, participating in this as well. So um, we'd love to have your story too. And you can um, go directly to this website, splot.ca extraordinary and uh, share your own story. Thank you for that. And now to our topic for today. And I just want to say a few things about it before we get right to our experts. Um, so something happened about two months ago, a little less than two months ago at most of our colleges, universities, and schools. Um, we had to close our physical campuses and, and pivot to remote instruction um, with many faculty who had no previous experience teaching online. This was something that almost no one had predicted and most institutions hadn't planned for. Um, students' lives are being disrupted by this adjustment, um, housing and job losses for students, um, additional family responsibilities and healthcare issues have arisen. Um, and commercial publishers are now offering faculty and students these one-time free instructional materials during the crisis. So something for um, us to consider as well as part of this mix. And colleges are facing really big issues uh, about their future, um, trying to maintain student enrollment and persistence during this difficult time and, and looking at what, what is it what is um, it going to look like next fall? Will we be able to reopen our physical campuses? Um, there's obviously some institutional shortfalls around budget. Um, will there be furloughs? So a lot of different questions um, are, are, are arising. And so our panelists today are going to focus on how OER, uh, prudent, um, fair use, and open educational practices can support teaching and learning right now during this disruption. and. Um, provide resilience for future disruptions um, while continuing to help contain costs, address student needs, and inspire um, innovation for the future. And I, one thing I wanted to mention um, was that in this time of disruption, we find that our, our marginalized students, these would be our underrepresented students, and also our students with disabilities are disproportionately impacted during this time. So it's something that we need to be very aware of in terms of looking at student engagement, retention, and persistence. And now on to our experts. And first up is, I'm very pleased to uh, have Tonja Connerly, once again, Professor of Sociology at San Jacinto Community College. Tonja? Thank you, Una. Good afternoon. My name is Tonja Connerly, and in October 2018, I had the privilege of writing an article for CCCOER pertaining to equity. And it was pertaining to equity and the situation uh, concerning Hurricane Harvey. Classes were stopped immediately due to uh, Hurricane Harvey because we were in drenched and inundated with rain for four days continuously. Our schools were closed down for two weeks, but through the use of open educational resources, we had basically started class immediately without any lag time at all. We find ourselves in the same situation. Currently, not only was, has Houston been affected by the coronavirus, but globally, our entire country has. But within a crisis, we're given the opportunity to promote OER. And through this promotion, we're providing equity for our, we continue to provide equity for our students. Again, as Una mentioned earlier, basically, a lot of us had to utilize open education resources within 168 hours, basically a week, we had a massive turnaround. But again, with the use of open educa educational resources, we were able to have what we called an instant gratification. In sociology, we call this form of instant gratification McDonaldization. This key term was created by George Zitzer, Witzler, I apologize, and he utilized this term basically to describe the type of society that we're living in right now. You know, at McDonald's, we wait in line for a burger for like about five minutes. Um, so this is pretty much where this terminology came from is that in our society, we just want things instantly. And this parallels closely 
our parallels, I should say, immediately to open educational resources. Because again, with this use, our students and our faculty have no lag time and we're able to uh, basically have a textbook, continue on with our education. I feel that there are four things that's going to contribute to us to continue um, with the use of open educational resources. And these four key components that I feel that will require for us to continue on with our equitable education is going to be the use of OER itself, us continuing to promote it. And this, we had a great example in reference to promotion of open educational resources last week with Creator Fest that was sponsored by OpenStax. During this presentation last week, um, the director of open educational resources, Daniel Williamson, uh, gave us some very valuable information in reference to equity and how OpenStax has continued on utilizing this. He discussed how OpenStax will be translating some of their textbooks into Spanish. He also talked about how textbooks will be downloaded into Google Docs. I'm very excited about this as a faculty member because I partner a lot with my psychology colleagues and now I'm really able to quickly uh, tailor my book and transpose some of the psychology information into my uh, sociology textbook. I think another key component that we're going to have to utilize in order to help us with this equitable education is going to be faculty training, or I should say professional development. As Una mentioned earlier, again, faculty having to transpose going from face-to-face -face online was really traumatic for a lot of people. I have lots of colleagues right now that is um, really contemplating on retiring because as much as they love teaching, they always wanted to teach face to face. They had no desire to teach online. We're very concerned about our students, but I'm also concerned about our students as well as our faculty members during this transition as well. This form of teaching pedagogy is gonna be challenging for a lot of them. So I think for us to continue on promoting our open educational resources, we're gonna to have to continue to partner to develop new pedagogy techniques for our faculty members who are new to teaching open educational resources. But I think that we need to most definitely keep in mind who our audience is and we need to keep it as simple as possible. I've had the privilege of teaching online and every modal, um, Blackboard, Canvas, Moodle. So it was it wasn't um, difficult for me in reference to going completely online. But again, my concern is that we continue to keep in mind our faculty members that have never taught online before, and they are excellent professors. And we too want to save them as well as we want to for our students. So to continue to promote this, our equitable education. Um, Una also mentioned about our students who are disabled. I had the opportunity to speak to our, um, one of our disability directors pertaining to what exactly did San Jacinto College do in order to assist our students who need additional assistance. And she said that she contacted, she and her team, contacted each one of our students who've ever completed a disability form for this semester to make sure that we meet them where their needs are. Again, promoting equitable education. Uh, meeting them with their needs can consist of uh, making sure that they have the right technology on their computer, making sure in reference to the closed captioning, making sure that the testing is uh, adequate enough for them. Partnering with the professors to make sure again that they are provide this information for um, their students who need this uh, type of attention. And I think one of the last things in reference to prof uh, professional development that we can do to continue on with equitable education is to partner with our librarians more. I think that they are such a hidden gem 
and that we do not utilize them enough for our resources in reference to open educational resources. Um, I am working with our librarians at San Jacinto College and hopefully we're going to start a program um, when the fall comes that they're going to literally adopt a faculty member or even adopt their discipline uh, in reference to researching to um, to assist them with incorporating open educational resources into uh, their um, into their uh, course discipline. The other factor that I feel that was going to be uh, beneficial and, and that we need it uh, is the hardware. Again, we may write the information concerning open educational resources, but we cannot um, do that without uh, housing, having, having a place to house it. And that's where the computers and the tablets and even uh, mobile phones are utilized. Uh, during this time, again, um, I think the corona uh, situation has really brought our eyes open again in reference to the haves and the have-nots. We cannot promote the use of open educational uh, resources without connecting or having some form of technology to house the information. So uh, going forward, I think that when we do our grants, our, we're promoting uh, the equitable education, we're gonna have to incorporate uh, some form of technology, whether it is a refurbished computer or tablet or even a phone. Because if we're gonna speak about open educational resources as being um, equitable education, we have to have hardware. So that's the reason why I entitled this OER plus technology is going to equal equitable education because we can't have one without the other. The last component that I would like to bring about is the internet. Um, again, during this time period, the have and have nots again have been uh, brought into our eyes most closely. Um, last week, Again, Daniel Williamson brought this up in reference to um, equity utilizing OpenStax, that how some rural areas are using internet in a box. We're gonna literally have to start partnering and thinking about this much more. In closing, I just want us to recap again about equity education and the four components in reference to hardware, uh, continuing on with OER, uh, professional development as well as um, the technology part. And I just wanted to update you in reference to what we are currently doing at San Jacinto College during this time period. Uh, we have provided so much support during this pandemic. Uh, financially, we are assisting our students from our uh, San Jacinto College Fund. We had a virtual gala where we can actually, um, it was a gala that was uh, already in, uh, that we purchased tickets for, uh, but again, we weren't able to attend it. So we had a virtual gala where you can donate money. Emotionally, uh, we are providing licensed counselors that we have, but one thing that everyone is involved in is what we call Sanjack Cares. We have administrators, we have faculty, we have staff, literally contacting our students to make sure that they are emotionally financially and educationally supported. And so uh, as one of the people on the uh, team of San Jack Cares, I am so proud to, to, to basically be able to contact our students. And it is such an awesome feeling to be able to know that you're able to help them at anywhere possible. And educationally, we are currently um, uh, supporting our students uh, by providing them laptops, uh, providing them computers when needed if they didn't have one, providing them online support for them as well as our faculty members. And also, um, we're able to maintain a good uh, balance in reference to our non-drop of students, very low or not, uh, and in some discipline, none at all, because they are automatically connected to our ed planners when they are trying to drop the course. So again, I just wanted to update you in reference to our, uh, the viewpoint of the equitable education and update you in reference to what San Jacinto College is doing currently during this pandemic. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much, Tanja, for sharing all of that. You've had a couple of um, comments in the, um, 
in the chat window and I'll let you take a look at that as we move okay. on to our next panelist. Okay, and we'll great. Come back at the end. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, next up is Susan Joaquin, um, who is the coordinator of Open Educational Resources, Student Learning Outcomes and Distance Education at Butte Community College in California. Suzanne. Hi, thank you, Una. Um, so if, if we could go to, to the next slide, I'll, oh, I don't have to look at myself, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna be talking a little bit about how open educational practices can build in some flexibility that allows us to respond more easily in times of crisis. And the framework that I'll be discussing is universal design for learning, because I think these two things work together really well to build in courses that are um, easy to, to navigate in turbulent waters. So the, the, the three terms that are listed, so the three uh, color items on the list here are the framework for universal design for learning. And I'll just kind of go through these fairly quickly. Uh, the first one is provide multiple means of representation. And the idea with this is that you give learners different options for how they learn. So in, in the chat, there was some discussion about print versus digital, right? So some folks learn better with with digital materials, maybe even interactives or videos, uh, but a lot of learners prefer print where they can you know, highlight and, and do the kind of tactile learning that is helpful for folks. And with universal design, the idea is to give students as many of those options as, is, as you can so that they can find the pathway that works best for them. And open allows us to, to do that more effectively because it provides the option of linking to lots of resources since they're all free. Um, you can also, of course, customize them so that you can link to exactly the right resources for exactly the right assignments. So that that is helpful in allowing learners to have these multiple resources without being overwhelmed with a lot of additional information. The next one is multiple means of action and expression. And this is all about allowing learners to choose how they demonstrate their mastery of a learning outcome. So for example, you might want to give uh, students a, uh, an option in how they, they demonstrate something using either drawing a, a, a complex diagram to explain a process or explaining the process in an essay or maybe using bulleted lists. Um, and so allowing students to have options in how they demonstrate mastery of knowledge can be really helpful in times like this, where we may not have access to the same sort of resources that we would have in a, in a you know, traditional sort of situation. And so that allows us to kind of pivot more quickly because uh, there's already options built in, so you don't have to give students more choice, it's already there. The last one is multiple means of engagement. And the idea with this one is to give students um, different entry points into the subject matter, so give, um, allow them to find entry points that make sense for them, that resonate with them, that are meaningful to them. And this helps us in, in the situations like this because it, it builds in a really easy way for students to connect the knowledge that you're trying to teach them to what's happening in the world currently. Um, and so you don't have to kind of rebuild your assignments to tie in to the real life situation happening right now. It's already built into the class. So these are, these are just some ideas for looking ahead, uh, building these into courses for, for the future as a way to buffer um, future emergencies in case they come up again. And so the, 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 um, the way to think about this is that Building courses using universal design and open educational practices is like building a course that has a live GPS rather than a static map. So that image is meant to represent um, that where the students should end up, meaning both the knowledge they gain at the end of the semester, the final destination, that doesn't change. What changes though is how they get there. And, um, and that is a little bit on UDL and um, OEP, lots of letters for you. And thank you enough for, for spelling those out in the chat. Thank you, Suzanne. And I love that metaphor of um, providing students with a live GPS rather than a, a static paper map. Um, all right. 
Um, next up, um, I hope is uh, Michael Mills, uh, the Vice President of, of E-Learning, Innovation and Teaching Excellence at Montgomery College. Mike, are you with us? I, I am, can you hear me okay? We can hear you great. Okay, great, I, I moved back inside after I had enough power charged from my car. Um, Thank you. So, as Una said, um, I am at Montgomery College, uh, located in Montgomery County, Maryland. We're, we have a, a robust OER program across our three campuses. And I wanna talk a little bit about uh, how we're seeing OER helping in our persistence rate and our retention rate during the, the COVID-19 um, situation. So Liz, if you could move to the, the next slide, please. Um, the first area I want to talk about is, is the access that we're seeing our students gain through Blackboard uh, on mobile devices. And, you know, we, I think we've, at least I've always thought OER provided a, a great opportunity for students to access their content on a mobile device. But I didn't know to what extent they would be doing that during this pandemic and, and how that might compare to previous semesters. So the other day I, I took a look at, at some numbers and from September 1st to December 31st of last year, so there was a 121 day period, we had about 132 average mobile accesses per day from students. Not, not a, a great number. Um, but you know it is is what it is. Looking at this current period, starting on March fifteenth, we've only seen an uptick of average mobile accesses per day to one hundred and forty. So we're not seeing a, a large increase in the number of mobile accesses. But where we are seeing tremendous uptick in access to content is the average mobile minutes per login. So last year, the last fall, we had about 950 average mobile minutes per login per day. For the spring period, this 49 day period that we looked at for the pandemic, we're at 2,800 average mobile minutes per login. And so what that is telling me, and we have a number of courses that are OER, that students are spending a lot of time on their devices able to access the content that is digital. Uh, they may have to be sharing uh, internet or Wi-Fi access. They may have to be sharing a, a desktop if they even have one. But by accessing through their mobile device, they're, they're able to spend a lot of time looking at that OER content uh, and not having to worry about the, the print versions or, or a book. We also know that many of our students, when they're on campus, may not be logging into that digital content on their phone, but maybe using an open lab uh, in the library or one of our computer centers. Um, so that, you know, I, I think that the OER persistence is, visible when you're looking at the access to mobile through mobile devices. The next area I want to touch on is the access to content on day one. So we we went to emergency remote structured teaching right around our spring break. Uh, just March 15th, we started our second half of the spring semester on March the 23rd. And what we were hearing the students who were not in OER classes were very concerned about how they were going to get their books for the, those eight-week classes that started on March 23rd. And so we spent a tremendous amount of time in different leadership meetings. Are students going to be able to come on campus? Are the bookstores going to ship out the books that students have are needing? Um, and then the faculty who were using OER were chiming in and saying, I don't have that problem. My students already have access to the material. They're not gonna be behind when we go into this emergency 
remote teaching environment because it's all digital. So it, again, it, it plays into having access at the beginning of class, something that we've always talked about. And at least at Montgomery in March, it really played out uh, to its fullest potential. Uh, the next area that I think we're gonna see more of, and I hope we see more of, is, is the concept of open pedagogy and how it ties in with COVID-19. Uh, we've already had some faculty start to talk about how they're incorporating COVID-19 into their assignments, how they're asking students to reflect on how this pandemic has impacted them, how they've impact, how it's impacted their communities. And I, I'm excited about moving forward with this because I think students can provide a lot of help with faculty in not only crafting assignments, but crafting projects that can help communities and community members move forward um, as we continue to deal with this remote teaching environment. Um, and then the last area that I wanna talk about is, is retention. And Liz, if you could go to the next slide, um, please. Uh, so here, here are some numbers <clears throat> for our spring semester. And we had anticipated, I think, some withdrawals by students who just, you know, were, were traumatized by the, the sudden shift in moving to an online environment. They didn't want to go to an online environment. But what we're seeing, at least in the OER courses, was that did not happen at all. Uh, these numbers are as of just last week. And our overall retention, and we have about 10,000 student enrollments in our Z courses, the overall retention is about 85% in those courses, slightly higher than the overall retention of the college as a whole. Um, and again, I think this is, this is a testament to the strength of OER. Uh, that number, 85%, is consistent from one semester to the next. Uh, this pandemic has had no impact when students staying in their classes that are OER classes. Uh, that 85% is, it was 85% in the fall, it was 85, roughly 85% in five or six semesters before that. So I think, you know, we see the power of OER, we see the staying power of OER and how it can help students be persistent and, and stay in classes and hopefully get to this finish line in the next week or so. So I, I wanna thank you, Una, for the opportunity to share what we have going on at Montgomery. Thank you, Mike. Um, and so these are the numbers for your OER classes? Yes. Wonderful, yeah, those are truly impressive. Um, so and I'd like to see those shared more widely. I, it, um, all right, well, on to our next speaker, which is Quill West, who is the OER project manager at Pierce College. She also does a lot of instructional design work there and is the former president of CCC OER Executive Council. Quill? Hey, everybody. Um, hopefully you're hearing me. My microphone says you can. So and I'm going to ask you to go to the next slide because you know, I don't want to look at myself either. Um, <laughs> um, I have been asked to speak with you a little bit about all those wonderful offers that came out from ed tech companies at the start of COVID-19's big shift to online learning um, and distance learning, where they were offering all these free options to use their platforms and their technology to improve your courses. And, um, how those things seem like a great offer, much like a cute free puppy, which I know so many people have, have adopted puppies during this time as well. But um, that concept of adopting free resources, um, free <laughs> technology platforms comes with some added responsibilities, much like a puppy. So um, I really wanna talk today about how our institution and other institutions have been helping to guide faculty into conversations about platforms that better match open education 
um, resources and, and the principles of the open education field because ed technology is free like puppies right now. Um, and what that means, you know, if you'll go to my next slide, is that sometimes puppies do things you don't expect them to do, like bring you a bunch of mud and a giant stick that you weren't expecting. And that giant stick can take the form of an added cost if you have created content that you want to keep using in the future using those platforms. Um, you may or may not be able to get it out of that platform so that you can use it in another form. So what is free today may have a cost tomorrow. Um, on top of that, um, you're never, sometimes those free technologies from a commercial pu printer, publisher, or commercial ed tech company come with added um, student privacy issues, students' rights issues. For example, if I'm making a student sign up for a resource so that they can use it in my in my online class, then um, the student is now faced with the reality that they have to, um, they have to either <laughs> choose not to participate fully in my course or give up some of their privacy so that they can participate. So um, those are requirements that everybody should be considering when you're adopting OER or when you're, excuse me, when you're adopting educational technology. And I know we know this, but I also know that sometimes something comes in that is just so slick and so cool and it seems like such a great idea at the time. Uh, and then we adopt it and um, it causes bigger challenges. So I want to remind everybody of the CARE framework. Um, so go ahead and um, so the CARE framework, um, I think this is what, two or three years old now, um, from Lisa Petridis, Doug Levin, and um, C. Edward Watson, that talks about what it means to be an OER steward, and really talks about um, sustainability of the resources and the work that we do because as OER stewards we are contributing to a community of users we're building a commons um, and so how much easier is it to own a dog when you're not the only person who owns and is responsible for training that puppy um, when there's somebody else there that can do things like practice um, the training protocols or can help um, cuddle when you don't have time to cuddle or be there when you're in a long meeting. Um, having a community to support and contribute is really important. So OER stewards do that. OER platforms do that. People who have considered open education as tools do that. Um, they give credit where it's due. That's what attribution is about. One of my most important things right now um, as faculty are creating more and more content is to think about um, the concept of evergreen content. If you're going to make it for your students today, can you um, share it, get it back out again, um, and give it to the commons so that it can be caretake, um, caretaken and you can use it again and again. Um, and if you build it in a platform that you're trialing for a quarter, then chances of getting it back out again um, and being able to use it over and over is really small. Um, or being able to use it in a variety of spaces. I know the chat has been really, really invested in conversations about um, print and whether or not we should provide free print resources to students because OER is really flexible and you can print it and send it to students if you need to um, because of technology concerns or just because of preferences in terms of how they interact with materials. Um, some digital platforms out there make it really, really, really hard to convert things from the resource that that they are written in into print. And so it's a really good idea to consider that. Um, for example, at Pierce College, our college success course found that students who started the start of this quarter, who thought, and we're a quarterly school, who really, really thought college success is something we require of all of our first quarter students, um, felt like they had the technology they needed to be successful in our courses. And then they're getting to the mid-quarter point of our of our um, quarter, because we're this is week five for us. Um, and they're finding that because everybody needs the electronic resources in their home, they're not the only one who needs a computer. So if they've studied, if they have their reading time scheduled and they're accessing their resource online, 
and somebody else needs the computer, they can't do their reading at that point. So they've asked for print resources and because it's built in an open platform and because it's built in a platform that considered how we get it back out and turn it into a print resource, we're able to give them printable or printed copies of those resources and just send them out whether they want them that way or not. Um, so it's, um, it, it allows for flexibility. Um, and so the last thing I really, really want to talk about is um, when you're considering new technologies, any new technology, think about the cognitive load that students are having to carry in terms of accessing resources in a, in a way they don't want right now, but in any format. If the technology is difficult to learn to use um, in terms of how do I make my learning happen out of this, then the student is having to fight technology as much as your content. And so it's really important. A lot of individual faculty throughout this um, time have been deciding what are the resources I can best use. And I continually point people to openly created, openly licensed tools because I know there's a community there to support them and there's a community to support the students who are trying to use those resources as well. Um, so I'm gonna say thank you and just keep reminding everybody of the CARE framework. Thank you so much, Quill, for sharing that and, um, and for giving uh, people kind of an evaluation rubric for how to measure the costs of accepting these free offers in the short term. And um, last but not least, certainly we're really pleased to have Meredith Jacob, who is the Project Director of Creative Commons USA at the American University Washington College of Law, uh, here to talk with us about um, how fair use and open educational resources can work together. Thanks, Una. Um, so, I think, you know, in the presenters before, we've heard a really convincing story about why open educational resources are really fundamentally different than commercially licensed resources in that they give faculty and institutions the control to adapt to changing situations, to make decisions about delivery to meet student needs, and to control cost and risk for students that are going into this really uncertain time. Um, in that moment, I think the question becomes, how do we create more uh, different open educational resources and more valuable OER? And how do we meet gaps in the existing OER um, universe <clears throat> so that more courses can be sort of brought on board? On the next slide, we talk through the sort of framework for that. So as you sit down to create OER, it's important to remember that OER is not a, you know, creating OER is not a closed booked test. So when you sit down and you wanna create OER, you need to think through what is the source material that you're gonna use? The knowledge, the examples, you know, where are you going to get that? Very few people will sit down in sort of a closed room and type only from memory. That would actually be in a lot of ways a really irresponsible way to create. And so as you think through creating new OER, um, there might be sources that you have a right to use, either material that is in the public domain or you're in fact only using the idea from something, not the copyrighted content. So for those things, you have a right to use them. You might also have a right to use it because of a limitation or exception to copyright law. That could be fair use or a different specific limitation or exception. And then if you don't have one of those rights to use it, then you need a license or other permission. And that could be a Creative Commons license, an institutional license, a purchase or a permission. So in the next slide, we have a framework to sort of think through this evaluation. The first question is, as I am doing this thing, Am I doing something with content that is protected by copyright law? And as you'll see at the bottom, there's sort of two big content buckets that fall into there. One is, and I think in a lot of ways, this is really fundamentally the largest thing, is that you are using ideas from existing content, but not using the expression, the writing, or the image itself. And in those situations, it's really important to keep separate uh, copyright concepts, concepts which cover the written expression 
or the photographic expression, the fixed thing, from concepts around um, plagiarism and academic integrity, which might require you to attribute. You might need to attribute where your ideas came if you took very specific ideas from a attribution and integrity standpoint, but that's not a copyright law issue. The other large body of content that is not protected by copyright is content that's in the public domain, either because it was created after, um, sorry, it was created in 1924 earlier, or because it was created by someone who uh, can't have copyright in their official work. So for example, copyright um, doesn't exist for works created by US government employees. So once you've made the decision, no, I think this thing is protected by copyright law, yes, it's protected. Then the question is, is there a limitation in the law that gives you a right to use that? In the US, the largest limitation that will give educators a right to use existing content is fair use. And we'll talk about that in the later slides, but the other buckets are also, is there a Creative Commons license or do you have another institutional license or permission? On the next slide, we'll look at the basic framework of fair use in the United States. So fair use is um, in both common law and the statute. And the statute is a four factor test, but in practice, in the last 20 or 25 years, those four factors have really been transformed or sorry, I've been condensed down into two questions. The first question is, are you doing something new or different, something transformative with that material? And is the amount you're using, whether a part or the whole, appropriate to that use? And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, then it's unlikely that you're providing a substitute for the copyrighted work in the original market, which is the only sort of financial issue that's relevant to fair use. On the next slide, um, we have some examples of where fair use works out sort of in the world at large. Fair use is the limitation in the copyright law that gives us the ability to do critique and analysis, to use excerpts to illustrate an argument, to make whole copies of a work to promote accessibility, do translation for language learning, um, and most importantly for this webinar, to develop new educational materials. On the next slide, there are some examples of how that may play out. Um, you might excerpt a passage for close reading, such as glossing new concepts, interspersing discussion questions, or doing translation for language learning. You might um, include an image for illustration of a teaching point or to document a historical event. And um, you may do all of these things in the context of a student assessment or student work. Um, when you're thinking through this, on the next slide, we have sort of a an implementation framework. You need to ask, what is your purpose? Um, once you know your purpose, then you go on to the next step. It's really important to think through, first off, why am I using this specific thing? Um, once you know your purpose, then you can compare it to the purpose of the original. Like, I'm using this to teach about uh, the civil rights movement versus this was originally used to report the news. So the question of, is it transformative, is only one you can answer when you've thought through what is your teaching purpose and what was the purpose of the original. So once you've figured out, this is my purpose, then you ask, is it different? Is it transformative? Can we compare it to the original purpose? Then you ask, does it substitute in the market for the original? You know, would someone reasonably use this instead of the other for the purpose the other was originally created for? And then while you're doing that, you wanna document a few things. If you're releasing OER, it's important to document what uh, materials are included under fair use. And that's so that other people who come in and look at the material can understand what you're giving them an open license to and what you've included under fair use. It's also important if it's not obvious to include what your reasoning was, what your analysis of your new purpose was. And that's because in many situations, including I think almost all situations in which a third party thing, an image or an excerpt is included in a new textbook, other users will have a very similar fair use analysis. So they don't need to go in and strip out all of the things that were included under fair use. You can keep those as you distribute it in the, in the textbook, but other people will want to get to understand what was your fair use analysis. Um, and then finally, on the next slide, we have a few um, caution flags as you're thinking through fair use and educational resources, which is um, there's less strong sort of 
uh, support for uses designed mainly to set a mood or grab an att people's attention. If you can't clearly enunciate uh, your purpose for using this thing, if you're just like, I think it's pretty, I think it's the right sort of theme, that's not gonna be a very convincing purpose for evaluating your fair use. Um, uses that aren't proportionate. So fair use can enable using the whole work if that's the correct amount for your teaching purpose. But if you're only examining one section or one paragraph, then that's the part you should use. You should use a proportionate amount. And then finally, you need to be careful when you're using commercial educational materials because for materials that were originally created for a teaching purpose, your analysis of whether or not it's substitutional will be different. That's not to say that you can never use them, but you want to make sure that you're not using them in a way that is substitutional. So, for example, you couldn't, um, it would be a less clear fair use analysis, and I think generally not fair use, for, to example, make a textbook by using chapters of existing textbooks. Um, on the other hand, you could very easily create a textbook or a um, assignment that use parts of textbooks to evaluate a history of teaching or a history of science perspective. So again, it's not about just what material you're using or how much, but also for what purpose. So that is a seven minute uh, sleigh ride through the basics of fair use. But um, as you go forward and you think about creating OER, I would just say, if we're gonna teach stuff that is um, accurate and culturally responsive, and if we're going to create OER across disciplines, then fundamentally we're gonna to have to grapple with issues of fair use and the law supports you doing that. Thank you so much, Meredith. And I, I wanted just to go back to that example you gave to kind of ground it and you, you mentioned it, but pretty quickly. So you said perhaps if you were writing a chapter of a textbook or on civil rights or maybe an entire textbook, you could use uh, perhaps, and I don't know if you said newspaper articles, but you could l use something that might have been copyright that is copyrighted uh, from that time frame in the textbook uh, citing fair use. Was that? Sure, yeah. So there's, I can give you a couple examples. Okay, I think uh, that'd be great. Uh, one example would be if you are teaching about um, the history of um, press coverage of foreign wars. It would be very hard to teach about the history of press coverage of foreign wars without using existing historical press, right? You could not sort of easily or responsibly go back and create fake articles for that. So you have to use stuff that's out there in the world. And um, so you could say, I'm gonna use a copy of the front page image from the New York Times from World War I, a copy of a front page image from the New York Times from World War II, copy of the front page image from New York Times from the Vietnam War, and one from uh, the global war on terror. And in those examples, uh, the first, the World War I one is probably no longer protected by copyright, but all the rest are presumably covered by copyright law. And what you would need to do is think through that analysis. What is my purpose? My purpose is getting my students to evaluate the changes in the critical press response to war. So that's my purpose. And then the question would be, what was the purpose these were originally used for? And the answer would be news reporting. And so are you using it for a different purpose, a transformative purpose? Yes. Is there a harm for the market for the original? Would someone reasonably do this instead of reading the current New York Times? No. Um, and it's important to note there that even though they might offer a license, that doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have a fair use. Um, and so in that situation, that would be something that you might reasonably do under fair use. Another important note is I've said use the front page image because that's probably what you'll do um, as the best solution for most students. But it is also important that fair use very strongly supports making things available for students um, with different um, access needs. So you could also OCR that and create alt text and descriptions so that all students had access to that. Fair use enables both parts of that. Does that answer your question? I have more examples, but I'm very aware of not taking up more than my time. 
uh, th thank you, Meredith. Um, let's let's hear from the audience about uh, questions. Uh, um, we've been having a, a lot of discussion back and forth in here. Um, someone asked a good question about uh, Creative Commons licenses, and, and Amy Hofer, thank you so much for answering that one. Um, uh, so I think that was a question about uh, who decides, who puts the Creative Commons license on a work, and of course it depends on um, your faculty contract if you're a faculty member. Um, so some some institutions um, it require uh, that the institution owns it, and others uh, allow the faculty to own their own work. So um, other questions for any of our speakers and. Um, I know we have run over a little bit on time. We'd hope to have a little bit more open time. Um, there's, for those of you, those of our, our speakers, um, there's been some great questions that you've been answering back and forth. And I wondered if um, anyone wanted to summarize any of the conversations that they'd had um, in the chat window. I, I saw one specific area, um, a number of, Folks were um, very pleased to hear about Tanja's um, college, San Jacinto, um, contacting their students. And we had a we had a couple of at least one person who mentioned um, Rachel Becker, who mentioned that her college had also done that, and the students were very grateful. Um, and as Sarah said, that it had, it had been organized by, by their executive leadership um, team, who had organized that. And Tanja. How was it organized at uh, San Jacinto? That too was um, organized by our um, um, by our, our um, senior um, leadership team. Uh, it's under the guidance of Dr. Alicia Harris, who is also uh, the vice chancellor of uh, of our diversity and inclusivity uh, committee as well. Oh, wonderful! Yes, and I see an. Um, Michelle also said that Manchester College had also reached out to their students. Um, are other speakers um, questions that you were answering in the chat window that you'd like to summarize? Well, one question I'd like to put to our audience actually is, um, were you surprised about uh, this fair use um, description by Meredith? Um, I know I had the pleasure of attending a webinar that Meredith gave um, a few weeks ago, might have been a month ago now, on fair use. And I was actually surprised um, how fair use can work with OER. I, I didn't realize the um, extent of that. And I wonder if others were also surprised at um, how fair use and OER can work together. <laughs> um, I would say, you know, it's really important, I think, when you're thinking about fair use to separate um, a little bit thinking through what you think is reasonable and what you think the law is before you sort of go too far down the path about thinking about risk. Because it's not that they aren't both important considerations, but you want to sort of know you know, do I think I can do this? Do I think it's legal? And then separately, you know, what would I want to do to think through or reduce my risk and not sort of conflate them together? I think that the other thing I would say is that education is sort of one of the core purposes of copyright law. And um, I think that fundamentally for the OER community to really expand and mature to cover more subjects. There are things we can't teach about unless we um, sort of grapple with fair use questions. And I would encourage people that I think it is less, it is more rewarding and less risky than it has felt in the past. Thank you for that. And we, we see that um, quite a number of folks um, found this helpful. Um, and some folks also said that their librarian has already been um, very familiar with fair use. So that's, I know librarians tend to have this knowledge. Um, and I know that when I give OER workshops, I always say, well, with fair use, talk to your librarian because I, I don't feel competent to speak about it. I, I can't say that I feel competent to, you know, give people advice on this, but I can certainly say that it's far more open 
than I originally thought. And I would, I would also say when you're working with your librarian, they might help you set up the framework, but you really need to be the person who sets the purpose. So, you know, the, who understands the purpose, right? Like you're the person when you say, I want to use this material in my OER, you have to dig into what is your pedagogical purpose there. That isn't a question your librarian can answer for you. And so that piece is the piece that you as instructors are the experts on. And that's the part that I think people really have the ability to dig in on. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are at the top of the hour. I want to give my speakers just a, a moment if any of them would like to uh, make a, a, any final remark before we uh, close down the webinar. All right, well, I want to thank everyone for taking time out of their busy day. Uh, in spite of the fact that we're all working from home, I think we're probably working more hours than we've worked <laughs> in the past. So um, I appreciate you coming and, um, and, and thanks so much to my uh, presenters, um, your expertise and your, um, and your inspiration is, is really, really helpful and really um, helps us to get through our day. So thank you all for joining us and we will um, see you in June, we hope, where we have one more webinar um, on user-friendly design with OER. Um, here's our stay in the loop link. You can look at that later. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and all of our presenters also are happy to answer additional questions. Thank you.